For anybody looking for the spring break vibe out here at the beach today, not going to find it. Just got done with the torrential downpour here in Miami over the past 48 hours, so everything is completely soaked. And uh, the beach is pretty empty, but it's beautiful out here. I wanted to take you guys out here and talk about how you might be entitled to a refund. That's correct. If you sold a house in the past few years, you might be entitled to a refund on some of the commission that you've paid. We all have heard about the National Association of Realtors lawsuit settlement. And what a lot of people probably don't realize is the $418 million settlement from the NAR is only a chunk of this puzzle right now because other real estate brokerages that actually had more than $2 billion in closed sales can actually be on the hook to pay their own settlement funds. So let's take a look at how you might be able to get some of this money back and if you're entitled to any of it. So in addition to the $418 million that the NAR is paying out, there's already been a reported $210 million in additional funds from various brokerages that they've agreed to pay in settlement funds as well. Now here's the crazy thing and something that people have been asking about a lot like, well, you know, who's getting all this money? Because there's a huge settlement, but we know that a lot of the lawyers are probably gonna suck up a lot of this money, guys. And the problem is, you know, talk about transparency with commissions. There's no transparency with this at all on how much any of these lawyers are gonna make. With a big settlement like this, especially about antitrust, they should def definitely be disclosing who's gonna be getting paid how much from this settlement, how much each one of these lawyers are gonna be making because this money is supposed to go to the people that supposedly got ripped off from paying the commissions, right? So it's not really fair if lawyers and attorneys walk away with the lion's share of the settlement funds. Now to make matters even more complicated, it depends on where you live, where you sold a house, all different sorts of things like that, and how long ago you sold the house, if you're even gonna be entitled to any of this money at all. It's crazy because in some parts of the country, you could be eligible to receive a refund on commission if you sold a home up to 10 years ago. That's pretty wild. So really think about this, guys. If you're somebody watching this video right now or you know somebody that has sold a house in the last 10 years, everybody should go to this website. I'm gonna give you guys the link here. I'll put it in the description down below too so you can go and find out if you're entitled to any of this money. But it's estimated that about 40 to 50 million people could be eligible to receive refunds on commissions, okay? So if you want to find out if you're eligible, you need to go to realestatecommissionlitigation.com. And this is not a sponsored segment or anything, I'm just giving this to you guys as you know part of my free helpful information that I'm always doing. This is just for you if you wanna try and get some money out of this. But it's like this, guys. 40 to 50 million people could be eligible to receive a chunk of this money, right? Well, if there's only 600 million to go around, even if the lawyers got nothing, right? Zero dollars, then each homeowner is only, would only get $12. If you take 600 million divided by 50 million people collecting money off of this, only $12 would be left over for people. And that's before all the lawyers get paid. So you know it's gonna be far less than that. So I estimate people aren't gonna be getting much more than, you know, five, 10, 20 bucks, maybe a couple hundred dollars if you're lucky in some cases. So I wouldn't get too excited, but hey, in an economy this tough, free money is free money. So if you're entitled to it, go get it. I actually thought it was gonna be kind of cool out here after all this rain, so I wore the t-shirt, but I'm actually kind of hot. So whatever, I'll suffer through it. Now the first big brokerage that has come out to pay their own uh, settlement fund is Compass, okay? Compass has recently agreed to pay 57.5 million in settlement claims. That's because they are the largest grossing brokerage in the entire country. Hello. <laughs> That's a friendly kid. So these big brokerage firms that reach over $2 billion a year in sales annually, they all could be on the hook for this settlement. And they have two choices. They can either agree to their own settlement like Compass just did, or they can agree to pitch into the pot for the NAR settlement, it's your choice. And if you don't wanna do that, then you're gonna be susceptible to fighting things off in court yourself. So I'm sure most of these big brokerages that bring in a lot of money each year are gonna be doing one or the other to just get off the hook and move on. So there is potential for this pot of money to grow and you could be entitled to more than just $12 
in the end. So that's why I'm telling you, if you sold a house in the last 10 years, or you know someone who did, go to this website, guys. It's totally free, just like all those other class action lawsuits. You know, I've probably made hundreds of dollars off these class action lawsuits myself over the years from like buying different Apple products when they've gotten sued and uh, being like a Bank of America customer, different things like that, that there's these lawsuits that happen. You just fill out a free form and you get a check in the mail like three months later. So make sure you do it. For anybody out there who does file a claim and you're eligible, let me know in the end. Obviously, it's going to be a while from now, but let me know how much you end up getting. I'm going to be curious to hear uh, what some of your refund amounts were and also let me know in the future how much you paid in commission and how much your refund was because I'm pretty sure the difference is going to be pretty high. Now regarding all of this, I saw a news story today talking about three tips for home buyers on what they should be doing moving forward since for the most part home buyers are going to be on the hook for paying their own real estate agents from now on if they want to have a real estate agent at all. So. I wanna take a look at some of their tips and see what we think about this. So the first and obvious tip is to shop for suitable agents. Like, yeah, no kidding, you know, you need to shop around, you need to talk to different people, you need to interview different people. And for anybody who needs help finding somebody, I have a free service, guys. I always have a link in the description below. I can get you set up with a couple different agents that you can interview for free as well and see if you wanna work with one of them. So. Feel free to use that service if you want to. Now here's where it gets already kind of crazy for me, guys. First time home buyers are the ones who kind of need the guidance of a real estate agent the most, typically. They have the most questions, they have no idea what they're doing, you know, they get bad advice from friends, family, and relatives that tell them to do one thing, you should actually be doing something else. You know, now that home buyers pretty soon are gonna be on the hook for negotiating commissions directly with their agents, you know, it's going to be coming down to what kind of service does your agent provide you and what are you getting in return for that service? And typically, the first time home buyer is going to need a higher level of service than somebody who's already bought and sold a few homes and is familiar with the process, right? Somebody like a first time home buyer needs to have their hand held throughout the process a lot more, which you can argue easily that a buyer's realtor was going to charge more for more hand holding than somebody that just needs you to write a couple offers, right? But the ironic part of that is first time home buyers don't have any money, okay? They buy the least expensive homes, they barely have enough money for down payments. How in the world are they gonna pay for their real estate agent to do any of this? You know, probably not. They're not gonna be able to. This is the problem I brought up in my video discussing all this stuff. All home buyers moving forward are gonna be vulnerable to this, but specifically first time home buyers because if you're going to be buying a house and you're going to use an agent after the middle of july this year when this new law goes into effect you will be forced to sign an exclusivity agreement with a buyer's realtor okay the problem with that is you don't really know what kind of services you're going to be getting until after you already hired them now obviously the services that you expect need to be outlined on that contract like for example I don't know how this is going to look moving forward. Nobody does, but it's like, okay, I am agreeing to show you a minimum of 20 homes for sale as a first time home buyer. I will agree to write a maximum of 10 offers. Okay. Things like that probably need to be spelled out in writing from now on if you're going to be paying somebody individually. Also maybe things like agent availability, like I'm available to take your phone calls between 10 AM and 7 PM you know, Monday through Saturday or something like that. There's gonna have to be protocols laid out in these buyer agreement contracts in order for you to get a sense of whatever you're gonna pay them, is it gonna be worth the money? Which kind of brings me to the next point that they give here in this story, because the next tip for home buyers moving forward is to utilize limited services or a la carte options. Now this is something that we don't have yet, but you're probably gonna see more of as buyers are gonna be on the hook for negotiating with their agents directly. So if you're somebody that's experienced, for example, and you just need somebody to write an offer, maybe you can find an agent that's willing to write, you know, five offers for $500 or something like that, and that's the only service you're gonna get from them. There's no, no home showings, there's no calling the seller's agent and figuring out this and that, it's just 
I'll write you the offer. That's it, okay? Maybe somebody just needs that. Or maybe you need somebody to write offers and somebody to set up showings for you, and that will be an additional fee, right? That could be some way that this would look in the future. But it also means that you're gonna be on the hook for doing a lot of the work up front, things that real estate agents used to do, like you're gonna be the one finding the, the homes for sale, you're gonna be the one researching the neighborhoods, figuring out questions about school districts or the individual homes. You're also gonna be the one setting up the showing appointments for yourself and um, all of those things you're gonna have to do on your own from now on if you want somebody to do like an a la carte service and just pay for a few different services of an agent once things start getting technical. But you're gonna have to do a lot of the heavy lifting and the legwork up front yourself. And some buyers might say, well, I'm already doing that, so what's the big deal? And that's fine, you know, but like I said, some people don't have any experience with this process, mainly first time home buyers, and are gonna need more handholding. And the people that need the more, most handholding are gonna be charged the most and they have the least amount of money to part with. So it's kind of an upside down situation. Or maybe you need to also pay for an a la carte service to help with negotiations. Because think about this, say you have an agent that is only gonna charge you $500 to write five offers, but if you want them to actually negotiate those contracts, you know, say there's a counter offer, right? That's not included in writing the initial offer. Say you need help negotiating timelines for closing, inspections, concessions from the seller, all those things, right? And if you need that, that's gonna be an additional service you'll have to pay for. It's gonna to be tough for home buyers to kinda of add all this up and figure out, okay, do I pay somebody a la carte just for the things I need? Or should I just go all in and you know, offer to pay them a percentage of the commission, a percentage of the sale, just like before, and they just do everything for me like traditionally has been done. So people are gonna to have to decide their own level of needs when it comes to buying a house from now on. Now the third tip that they give is to negotiate for reduced agent fees. Like, well, yeah, no kidding. That's what everybody's gonna be trying to do from now on. Everybody's gonna to try to pay less commission, right? Which I can already imagine the headaches that's gonna give real estate agents. Like every single day, you're gonna be getting beat up on how much you're gonna be charging people to do work because nobody wants to pay you. They just want you to do it for free. And there might even be timelines involved here. Like say, for example, a real estate agent that needs to put in months worth of work and show people dozens of different properties before selling a house probably deserves to get paid more money than somebody who just got lucky with the client and you know they show them a few houses over the weekend they already made an offer and they close a month later you know and that kind of stuff happens you know it happened to me too some deals were very easy and they're just you're just lucky things just fall into place and other ones are a massive pain in the ass. You know, and you really have to work for the commission and sometimes those deals don't even end up closing. That's the worst part. Sometimes the ones you work the hardest on actually don't even pay you in the end. So it's tough, it's a tough game. And there's also talks about negotiating a lower commission, especially with higher end properties because that's something that we already kind of see right now. Like if you're gonna go buy a house that's like two, three million dollars and up, there's a high probability that the seller's already not paying a 6% commission, they negotiate it lower because the sale price of the home is so high. So even getting a lower percentage of the commission is still a good deal for the realtor because the sale price is so high. And the other thing is when it comes to people in general, some people are just more ready to buy a house. Like this kind of relates to this, the experience scenario where some people have gone through the process several times of buying and selling and they don't need that much hand holding. But besides that, some people, they just don't know what they want, right? Like some people need to be shown 20 houses before getting the idea of what they even want to buy, right? To see what the options are and, you know, get an idea of what's out there. But other people, they're like, yeah, I know exactly. I want this type of house in this neighborhood and it needs to be at least this many square feet and have a pool and a two car garage. Like, People that are that specific and know exactly what they want are gonna be much easier to find a house for versus somebody that's kind of clueless. So once again, this goes back to the people that don't know much about buying a house are gonna be the ones who are on the hook for paying the most in commissions and realtor fees because they're just gonna be spending more time with those clients versus people that have already been in the game and around the block before. I'm especially interested to see how this is gonna work out for 
inexperienced home buyers and uh, see what their end results are going to be when all this comes through. But if all this sounds too overwhelming for you guys, don't forget there's always the option you can just rent. In fact, there was a new story today that came out saying that they estimate in about five years from now, there's a real estate firm called CBRE and they track real estate prices and average uh, rent prices and things like that. They estimate that even in five years from now, it's still gonna be far more expensive to buy than it is to rent, just like it is right now. So they're predicting that for the foreseeable future, renting is gonna be the much cheaper financial option when it comes to housing. And I, when I see stuff like that, it just makes me question how many people are gonna to continue to opt into buying homes knowing that the payment differences are this high, because it's very high. Take a look at this. Right now, the average monthly payment on a new apartment lease in this country is about $2,165 a month, okay? The average monthly payment on a mortgage for a new home is $2,997. So you're talking about $700 a month more on average, and that's a 38% increase. So that's a big difference between buying and renting. I think a lot of people are just gonna have that choice made for them because they won't be able to afford the higher cost of owning a home. And that's one of my bearish cases against the housing market and has been for a long time. Just the fact that when people look at the differences in these payment numbers, and those are just the averages, that a lot of people are just not gonna be able to jump in to buying a home because they won't be able to afford to. Other people might be financially savvy and they see these crazy returns that people are getting in the stock market and Bitcoin right now and be like, why on earth am I gonna spend more on my monthly house payment? I'll just rent and I'll take that excess money and throw it into these investments and make all that free money, okay? And get rich that way. And rather than maintaining a house and worrying about the next repair I have to deal with and worrying about my insurance and property taxes going up exponentially. That's always gonna be a personal choice for people. There's nothing new about that either. But CBRE, they estimate that even by the year 2030, that mortgage payments are still expected to cost about 11% more on average than rent payments in the US. So obviously, just by their estimate, they're not factoring in any sort of housing downturn in the future either, because by saying that, then they must think that homes are gonna remain expensive forever. You're never gonna see home prices come down. That's kind of what this prediction also says by default. But I don't know how this is gonna end up in the end, guys. Like you have the government throwing money at buying real estate still. We talked about that a couple days ago, all the programs that still exist, even things that were invented to help people continue buying more expensive homes like the 30-year mortgage. Now, more people that can't afford those are being pushed into 40-year mortgages. There's home buyer incentive programs, there's home buyer tax credits, there's home buyer grants, there's lots of free money being thrown at housing still. And at the same time, 25% of people that are renting right now, they are spending more than half of their income on rent. So there's a high probability that somebody in that situation is never gonna be able to own a home because they're never gonna be able to save enough money to become a homeowner, even with all these home buyer incentive and assistance programs. Now, the other day I did my latest update on the condo crisis here in Florida. And afterwards, one of my viewers, Terry, sent me some info about a condo in Marina del Rey, California, that is having massive problems just like here in Florida. And I would say arguably worse when you look at these numbers, guys. Take a look at this sheet that she sent me about the financial woes at this condo over there, okay? Right now they only have $6 million in reserves, okay? But in order to have fully funded reserves, they need 62 million. So they're only 9.6% funded which means they need to be adding about $263,000 a month in 2024 to build up these reserves. They're trying to pass a $49 million special assessment this year in 2024 to make that happen. Now let's do some quick math because there's 701 units there and obviously they're not all gonna be the same size and your special assessment is always gonna be based on the size of your unit, okay, the square footage. But for the sake of simplicity, 
let's do some math here. Even if everybody were to pay an equal amount of the special assessment there, people are looking at almost $70,000 each, guys. $69,900 is the $49 million divided by 701. You know for some people they're going to end up paying way more than that because somebody that has a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom condo in this building is going to pay substantially more than somebody that only has a one-bedroom or a studio, for example. And they even had this little uh, colored graph below saying reserve fund strength weak risk of special assessment high. Like that's just like saying you know, what are the chances it's going to rain today when you see a dark cloud over your head? It's like chances are 100%. It's about to pour. <laughs> and then to make matters even worse, they're building up this reserve fund, right? And you can see here that their estimate after tax of the interest earnings on the reserves account, they're only going to be earning 2%. That's after tax. So yeah, you can get 5% on a savings account right now. But after you get tax on that, they're saying 2%. But inflation is 3% according to this, right? Which we know it's actually a lot higher. So even though they're gonna be pouring all this money into a special assessment reserve fund and earning interest on it, a portion of that money is still being siphoned away by inflation and the value of the dollar currently collapsing, guys. Think about that. This is a little nightmare situation for somebody to be in right now. And I'd be willing to bet condo owners in this building will be giving away these units to get out from under this right now. I already see situations like this unfolding here in Florida too. So get ready guys, things are about to get rocky out there, you know? These real estate projections and economic projections that everything's gonna be great and the Fed's gonna cut interest rates a few times this year and real estate's gonna continue going up in value over the next several years. Sounds pretty far-fetched when we're looking at this level of economic uncertainty right now. But I'm not saying it's impossible. I just think that the odds of this happening are not so likely based on the current conditions. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you go figure out if you're owed some money on your commission refund. And if you don't wanna wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here, and I'll see you in the next one.